Chapter 38 Tuesday couldn't pass quickly enough for Ian. He'd posted his and Emma's DNA tests first thing Monday morning, paying extra for same-day delivery. This came with the option of tracking the parcel online, so he knew it had been delivered and signed for at 3.20 on Monday afternoon. If mygenetichistory.com got to work on analysing their samples of saliva straight away, which their website had said they would, then the results could be available later today, Ian thought. He'd been checking his personal email regularly throughout the day, even though he was at work. So far, all he had received from the company was a standard acknowledgement that his test kits had been received. Ian conceded he had little idea of what exactly was involved in analysing DNA. But lots of companies offered the service, so he assumed it couldn't be too complicated. At 4pm, nearly 24 hours after the parcel had been delivered, Ian checked his email again. Still nothing. Their samples were probably in a queue waiting to be dealt with. Perhaps a phone call would help move them up the list. Good afternoon, my genetic history. How can we help you? A friendly female voice answered. I sent you saliva samples yesterday. I was wondering when we could expect the results. Our names are Ian and Emma Jennings. It can take up to three working days, she replied. I saw that on your website, but I'm assuming that includes postal delivery time. I opted for the results to be emailed. Could you check where they are in the system, please? Just a moment. I'll see if I can find out. Thank you. Ian then had to listen to a few minutes of the Blue Danube holding music before she came back on the line. I've spoken to our technician, and she says the results are waiting to be checked and should be with you this evening. If not... It'll be first thing tomorrow. This evening would be better, Ian said. I understand, but all our results are double-checked before they're sent out. We can't afford to make mistakes. Each DNA sample is analysed at more than half a million genetic markers. It's very thorough. Which Ian had seen on their website. All right, thank you, Ian said. Remember, email, not post. Yes. It's noted in our system. Ian continued to check his emails every 15 minutes or so, and then again as he left work at 5.30. Still no results. He'd been the first to admit he wasn't good at waiting, never had been, especially when it relied on someone else's efficiency. He hadn't told Emma the results were expected this evening. He wanted time to read and digest them, before he'd shared what he'd learnt. She was still convinced that a professional clinic wouldn't make errors in their record-keeping. Quietly, Ian agreed. He knew it was a long shot, and he suspected that the results would vindicate the Mollers, and he'd have to accept that. Emma, having returned to work on Monday, was home just before Ian. As he let himself in, he could hear her in the kitchen preparing their evening meal. The talk she'd had with their midwife and then returning to work had done her a power of good. The last couple of days, she'd been in a much better frame of mind. So Ian was looking forward to coming home and seeing her again. Hi, love, he called as he hung his coat on the hall stand. Hi, she returned from the kitchen. He dropped his briefcase in the living room on his way through to the kitchen, where he kissed Emma's neck. She didn't immediately pull away, which gave him hope that before too long they'd be completely back to normal. Anything I can do? he asked. No, dinner will be about a quarter of an hour. I'll change out of my suit then. Ian went upstairs to their bedroom, where he took the opportunity to check his phone again for an email. Still nothing from mygenetichistory.com. He would look again after dinner, and then every so often during the evening, furtively, so Emma couldn't see. Their relationship was improving, and he didn't want to risk doing anything that might spoil that. At 7.30, after they'd eaten and washed up, 
Emma settled in front of the television to watch a soap, and Ian surreptitiously stole another glance at his phone. A new email had arrived in his inbox from mygenetichistory.com with a large attachment marked Confidential. Their results. His heart missed a beat. He took his laptop from his briefcase and sat at the dining table. Emma glanced over. Work, he said. She nodded and returned her attention to the television. Barely able to contain himself, Ian opened the email. Dear Mr Jennings, I have the pleasure of attaching your results. Then there was a paragraph stating that the results should be read in conjunction with the explanatory notes. Ian saved the attachment before opening it. He began to read. Emma's results first. Gradually making sense of the graphs, numbers, estimates and percentages. So Moller had been right on that count, at least. She didn't carry any genetic condition. He then looked at his results. Ten minutes later, he'd concluded that neither did he. Moller had been telling the truth. The last two pages were the results of their paternity tests. He scanned down to the conclusion. And that needed no explanation. His heart stopped. There was a 99% chance that he and Emma shared the same biological father which meant they were half-brother and sister. Ian felt physically sick. Chapter 39 Jan had decided she needed proof, something she could show Chris, Ruby and the police. Firm evidence that there was something living in the woods. Evidence that wouldn't disappear like a ball of twine and couldn't be misinterpreted as the muddy footprints on her car had. She needed a photograph, so there was no doubt. The ball of twine had appeared and then vanished again, and Jan found she wasn't really surprised. Whoever, whatever was out there was tormenting her, toying with her like a cat playing with a mouse maybe even having a laugh at her expense. They were trying to make it appear as though she was imagining things and losing her mind, but she knew she wasn't. She was still sure Chris had seen something on the night he'd taken her out, even though he wouldn't admit it. And Ruby had been convinced she'd heard one of them at the window, although she was now trying to rationalise it. She texted on Monday, Sorry for my hasty departure. I feel a fool. I expect it was nothing. Just the wind in the trees. No, it wasn't the wind in the trees, Jan thought. She'd seen how scared Ruby had been. She hadn't been able to get out of the cottage quickly enough. Ruby would receive a photograph once Jan was able to take one. She had a plan. Chris and Camille had both said that whatever was coming into the garden was probably hungry and looking for food. So the obvious way forward, Jan decided, was to entice them into the garden with food and then take a photograph. But what did they eat? She had no idea. Were they carnivore, herbivore or omnivore? She'd leave out a selection of what she had. If they didn't take the bait this time, then she'd buy other foods, but not live prey. With a shudder, Jan wondered if they'd been trying to hunt Tinder, but dismissed that idea, as they would have got him by now if that was their intention. They had plenty of opportunities. Jan hadn't heard them on Sunday night, and neither had Tinder. If they'd come into the garden, they must have been very quiet. But then last night, as she'd been watching a film, she'd heard a noise outside the living room window. Tinder had immediately pricked up his ears and shot off the sofa, a sure sign there was something out there. But by the time she opened the back door, they'd gone. Tonight would be different, though. 
she was going to summon all her courage and stay downstairs, all night if necessary, to get the photograph she needed. At seven o'clock, Jan let Tinder out for his evening run. It was still quiet in the garden. He returned straight away after doing his business. Jan then gathered together a selection of food, including some fruit, and put on her jacket. She wouldn't switch on the motion sensor light, as it might scare them off. Taking the torch from its hook in the hall, and making sure Tinder didn't follow her, Jan went outside. She began arranging little piles of food on the patio, right outside the living room window. As she worked, she listened out, but there was nothing to suggest they were close by. Returning indoors, Jan switched off all the lights, opened the living room curtains, and then lay on the sofa where she couldn't be seen from outside. She had brought down her duvet, and her phone, with the camera engaged, was ready beside her. Thankfully, it was a calm night with no wind or rain, so there was nothing that could put them off or spoil the photograph. Pulling the duvet over her, she lay still and listened. The minutes ticked by. 8.30 came and went. 9. 9.30. Tinder slept at her feet. Another hour passed, but no sound from outside. Jan felt disappointed. She should have asked Ruby what time she'd heard them. They were usually here before now. Was it possible they knew she'd set a trap and was lying in wait to photograph them? She'd never left food out before or had the curtains open after dark. Were they really so clever that they could see her intention by a change of routine? An icy chill crept up Jan's spine and she pulled the duvet closer around her. By midnight, Jan was struggling to keep her eyes open. She dared not get up and make a coffee, for if they were out there watching, they would see her and bolt. They never stayed once they'd been seen, but always ran away. She would need them still for a few moments to take a photo, hence the piles of food. She shifted position and willed herself to stay awake. As one o'clock approached, her eyes closed. Then suddenly she was awake, startled by a noise outside. Senses tingling and her breath coming fast and shallow, she felt for her phone. Keeping low and out of sight, Jan carefully slid the phone from beneath the duvet and slowly began to raise it. Just high enough over the back of the sofa so she could take the photo. At the same time, she carefully drew herself to her knees. She'd only get one chance. But at that moment, Tinder heard it too, and leaping from the sofa ran towards the back door, barking loudly. Jan took the picture anyway, but knew even before she looked at it, she'd been too late. Just a view of the reflection of the flash on the glass. Tomorrow she'd try again, shutting Tinder in her bedroom first, and with the flash turned off. Chapter 40 Ian was still awake in the early hours of Wednesday morning, angry, upset, confused and agitated, trying to decide what to do next. Moller had lied. The DNA results had shown that while he and Emma didn't have any inherited genetic conditions, they did share the same biological father. Little wonder they looked similar, Ian thought bitterly. They were half-brother and sister. It was the worst possible outcome, and Ian was struggling to cope. He lay in bed, a small light coming from the street lamp outside plagued by thoughts of what he'd learned as Emma slept beside him. She was in a deep sleep, and her breathing was soft and shallow. Lucky her, Ian thought bitterly. He hadn't told her yet. 
when he'd finally come to bed shortly after 1am, she'd stirred, turned over and cuddled up to him, wanting to make love. He'd recoiled in feigned sleep. Now he knew they were related, he wasn't sure what he felt towards her. Not his wife, more like a friend or sister, which he supposed in some ways she was. Clearly there would be no more children. This was the end of the road for their hopes of a normal family life, and Ian had no idea how he was going to tell Emma. He moved his legs away from her and tried to relax. He really needed to get some sleep. He had work tomorrow, but his anger persisted. Moller had ruined their lives and Ian wanted him to pay one way or another. He'd go to the clinic tomorrow and have it out with him. But then, on reflection, Ian wondered if that was a good idea. He doubted he was going to get any more out of Moller than he had the last time. Moller had lied. So why would he tell the truth now? Also, if Ian lost his temper, which he could easily do, he might do something he later regretted. Perhaps it would be better to report him to the police and let them take care of him. Yes, that seemed to be the best plan. But then again, Ian could picture going into Coleshaw Police Station and having to explain to the duty officer about the clinic and donated sperm. How embarrassing that would be. Especially if others were there. Added to which... The moment he began talking about their dead babies, he knew he'd cry and make a complete fool of himself. Emma stirred beside him, and giving a small groan mumbled something in her sleep, which gave Ian another idea. The detective constable who'd come to see them already knew about the death of their last baby. He wouldn't have to go through it all again with her. She'd seemed clued up and sensitive and as a detective could investigate. It would be easier talking to her than going to the police station. But what was her name? Ian tried to remember. She'd introduced herself as... What was it? She'd shown her ID, but he'd only glanced at it, not long enough to remember her name. I'm Detective Constable from Colshall CID, she'd said. But what name had she given? Her first name began with B, he thought. And it was only a short name. Not Bella, Babs, but something like that. B, B, Beth. Yes, he was certain. Her first name was Beth. Try as he might, he couldn't remember her surname. But there couldn't be too many detective constables called Beth at Colshaw CID. He'd telephone the station in the morning, although he wouldn't tell Emma about any of this. Not yet. Once he had all the facts, he'd have to sit her down and break the news to her as gently as he could. She'd be distraught, of course, just as he was. The longer he could postpone it, the better. That dreadful moment when he shattered her life. Chapter 41 Ian woke before their alarm. He looked at Emma sleeping peacefully beside him and felt envious. Ignorance is bliss, he thought. How he would have liked to take her in his arms gently kiss her awake and then make love. But that would never happen again. Now he knew they were related. It seemed she and her mother had been right when they'd said no good would come of delving into the past. He wished he'd listened to them. For what he'd learnt could not be unlearnt. It was a burden he would carry forever. Carefully moving away from Emma, Ian slowly lifted his side of the duvet and slipped from the bed without waking her. He silently gathered together his office clothes and went into the bathroom to shower and dress. As he finished, he heard their alarm go 
and then a few minutes later, Emma on the landing. You're up early, she called. Yes, I have an eight o'clock meeting at work, he lied. Do you want coffee and toast? No, thanks. I'll pick up something en route. Ian waited until Emma was downstairs in the kitchen so he wouldn't have to see her before he came out of the bathroom. He collected his suit jacket from their bedroom, then went quietly downstairs, picking up his briefcase from the living room, and called goodbye as he let himself out. The crisp, cold air hit him. He got into his car and then sat for a minute with the engine running, waiting for the windscreen to defrost. Their neighbour, Mrs Slater, appeared at her bedroom window. He nodded politely, but she turned away. She still wasn't speaking to them, which Ian thought was probably for the best. Heaven forbid she got wind of what he'd found out. They'd be reviled, the subject of local gossip, and ostracised for being unnatural. It was eight o'clock as Ian pulled into the car park of Weatherby Security. It was largely empty at this time of the morning, as the majority of employees started work at nine. Nevertheless, he parked away from the entrance and exit, took out his phone, and then searched online for the phone number of Colshaw CID. I'd like to speak to a detective constable there, he said as soon as the call handler answered. My name is Ian Jennings. The officer visited my wife and me a few weeks ago. I'm sure her first name was Beth, but I can't remember her surname. D.C. Beth Mays? Yes, that's her. Can I speak to her, please? I'll see if she's in. What's it in connection with? Ian hesitated and swallowed hard. Our baby. I'm sure she'll remember if you tell her it's Ian Jennings. I live in Booth Lane and she saw my wife Emma twice. Hold the line, please, and I'll check if she's here. It was a minute or so before he came back on the line. I'll put you through now. Thank you. Good morning, Mr Jennings, Beth said. How are you and your wife? All right. Well, actually we're not. We've just had some awful news, and I need your help. You see, I've discovered that my wife and I are the children of donor sperm. Do you know what that is? Yes. To make matters worse... I've just found out that we share the same donor. We're related. Emma and I have the same biological father. I didn't think that was allowed. It's not. And the man who runs the clinic where the sperm came from lied to me. He told me we couldn't possibly have the same donor, but I've had our DNA tested, and we most certainly do. There's no doubt about it. I see, Beth said gently. This must be the reason Emma and I can't have healthy children, although we don't appear to have any inherited conditions. I'm sorry, Beth said. This must have come as a huge shock to you and your wife. But I'm not sure I can help. How is it a police matter? Carsten Moller, who owns and runs the clinic, lied to me. I'd like you to find out why. Ian heard Beth's hesitation before she replied. From what you've told me, Ian, I don't think it's a police matter. But if you wait a moment, I'll check. Thank you. It was a few minutes before Beth came back on the phone. As I thought, it isn't really a police matter. In the first instance, you'll need to raise your complaint with the practice manager at the clinic. There isn't a practice manager, Ian said. It's just Carsten Moller and his wife. In that case... If it's an NHS clinic, then you could contact the ombudsman. It's not. It's private, Ian replied, struggling to hide his impatience. I think you'll need to take it up with the independent adjudication service then. There's information about their organisation online. So you definitely can't investigate, Ian asked, disappointed. Not unless a crime has been committed. And from what you've told me, it hasn't been. I'm sorry. I don't see how I can help you. Frustrated and feeling let down, Ian said goodbye and ended the call. Now what? he thought. He stayed in his car, staring out of the side window. If he took DC Beth May's advice 
and contacted the adjudication service, he'd have to go through everything that had happened all over again, and then wait for the outcome of any investigation. How long would that take? Probably forever, especially if Moller prevaricated or lied again. He needed answers now. Perhaps he should return to his first plan and visit Castor Moller in person. He had the DNA evidence now, and that couldn't be ignored. If he showed him the results, Moller would have to tell him the truth, wouldn't he? Ian couldn't think of a better plan. He'd go now, but before he started his car, he sent an email to his boss. I have a doctor's appointment today, so I'll be working from home. He then switched on his sat-nav and drove out of the office's car park. The DNA test results proved Moller had lied, and Ian was ready for a fight. Chapter 42 It was 9.15am as Ian passed the village shop with his advertising easel outside. Wound up and ready to confront Castor Moller, he drove up the hill and parked in the road at the front of the clinic. There were two cars on the driveway, a BMW he'd seen there before, and a Vauxhall Corsa. Ian wondered if that belonged to Edie or a patient. If it was a patient, it could work in his favour. Moller wouldn't want him creating a scene if he had someone with him. Ian took his briefcase containing his laptop from the passenger seat and got out of the car. He walked purposefully up the path to the front door. He turned his back on the CCTV as he pressed the bell, although he had little doubt he could still be identified. He waited and pressed the bell again for longer this time. He'd stay there pressing their damn doorbell for as long as it took them to answer. He wasn't going to be fobbed off again. He had evidence now. The door opened, and Edie Moller appeared, face set to a professional smile. Yes, Mr Jennings, how can I help you? I want to speak to Carsten, Ian said. Yes, of course, come in, Edie replied to Ian's surprise. He had been expecting excuses. Carsten has someone with him, Edie continued, as she showed him into the waiting room. Please take a seat, and I'll let him know you're here. There are some magazines on the table. Hopefully he won't be long. Would you like a coffee? No, thank you, Ian replied stiffly, and sat in one of the chairs. With another polite smile, Edie left the room. Ian glanced around absently drumming his fingers on the wooden armrest. He needed to calm down so he could think rationally when he presented his case to Moller. He doubted Carsten would readily admit to his mistake, so Ian would need to prove it. He took out his laptop and opened the file containing the DNA results so it was ready, then returned his laptop to his briefcase. He picked up a magazine and put it down again. He heard a door open and slam shut in the hall, followed by footsteps hurrying down the hall. The front door opened and slammed shut. Interesting. Whoever it was had left in a hurry, and from the sound of it, angry. Ian would have liked to know the reason. The door to the waiting room opened, and Edie Moller appeared, looking slightly flustered. Mr. Moller will see you now, she said tightly. Ian stood and followed her into Moller's office, where he'd seen him before. He was standing beside his desk, apparently not fully recovered from his previous encounter. Yes, Mr. Jennings, he said rather sharply. You wish to see me? Ian took a deep breath. Going over, he stood beside Moller and set his laptop on the desk, angling the screen so they both could see it. Edie Moller was waiting by the door. When I asked you before to check if Emma and I shared the same donor, you told me we didn't, Ian began, immediately hot and flustered. I now have absolute proof we do. I've had Emma's and my DNA analysed, and there's no doubt we have the same biological father. Here are the results. I'll call you if I need you, 
Muller told his wife. Ian saw a muscle twitch nervously in his cheek. Edie Muller left the room. Read this, Ian said, pointing to the paternity test results. A 99% chance that Emma and I share the same biological father. You can't get a result higher than that. And the only way we share the same father is from donor sperm supplied by your clinic. Ian drew himself up to his full height and glared at Moller. Caster Moller barely looked at the screen and certainly didn't have time to read and digest the results before he sat behind his desk, outwardly composed. Take a seat, please, he said, waving to the chair on the other side of the desk. Ian picked up his laptop and sat down. If those results are correct, Moller began. They are, Ian put in. Then it would appear we have made a dreadful error here. Unprecedented in the history of my clinic. Donors are allowed to donate more than once, but we work within the correct guidelines. Statistically, there is a very slim chance of this happening. And to make matters worse, it seems I must have made a mistake in my record-keeping. I will, of course, look into it thoroughly, and if I find we are at fault, you and your wife will be compensated. Ian stared at him, confounded. He had come here expecting denial, then an ugly scene where he would have to force Moller to admit his mistake. But it seemed he was open to the idea. If you could email me a copy of those results, Moller continued, I'll be able to compare them with my records. Ian took a moment to connect his laptop to the Wi-Fi and emailed the file. It should be in your inbox now. Thank you, Moller said. I will study it this evening, when I can give it my full attention and then contact you. How can you check? Ian asked suspiciously. You won't still have the donor sperm. All you've got are your records, and if they're incorrect, as they appear to be, what else can you do? Each donor is given a number, and that is how they are identified. When I checked your and your wife's records before, it showed different numbers, indicating the sperm was from different donors. However, I will cross-check the numbers are correct by using the actual identity of the donors. It will take me a while, but it will be conclusive. Let me assure you, if I find the donor is the same, there will be no cover-up. I will take full responsibility and compensate you as best I can. How can I be sure? Ian asked. You have my word. I would like to see your records for myself, Ian said. I'm afraid that's not possible. They're confidential. But why would I risk the reputation of my clinic and lie to you? I'm not stupid. I know if you're not satisfied, you'll go public and that would be to the detriment of my practice after all these years. Please, give me the chance to investigate, and then we can discuss the matter further. It's in my interest to make sure you're satisfied, isn't it? Moller was being so reasonable, Ian felt he had to give him time to look into it. All right, Ian said. Check your records. But I know my test results are correct. Quite possibly, Moller said in the same convivial manner. I will be in touch as soon as I have investigated the matter. Will that be all? he asked politely. Ian nodded, and closing his laptop, returned it to his briefcase. Thank you for bringing this to my attention, Moller said. He stood and came out from behind his desk. I'm sorry you've had all this worry. I will do my best to put it right. I promise you. He opened the door. Edie Moller was waiting on the other side to show Ian out. Goodbye, Mr. Jennings, Carsten said. Bye, Ian mumbled, and followed Edie to the front door. Outside, Ian saw that the other car had gone. Deflated and confused by Moller's reaction, Ian returned to his car. He'd arrived half expecting not to be let in and for Moller to then deny that any error could have occurred. Yet 
he'd admitted straight away that a mistake was possible, and even mentioned compensation. Ian didn't trust him, though. There was something shifty about the man. And he hadn't been surprised by the DNA results. Indeed, he'd barely glanced at them, almost as if he'd known what they would show. Perhaps he'd been using the same donor more than was allowed. How Ian would have liked to see Moller's records for himself. Then it occurred to him, there was a way. But it was illegal. If he got caught, he'd be prosecuted, lose his job, and never work again. Chapter 43 Shortly after three o'clock that Wednesday afternoon, Jan left Lillian's shop in Maryless and returned to her car. Dropping the bag of groceries on the rear seat, she started the engine and headed back to the cottage. She was using her car now to visit the store, as it felt safer than walking along Wood Lane. There'd been more muddy footprints on her car that morning and at the front door. They were getting braver and she wasn't taking any risks. Tinder missed his walks, but he could go in the garden. She turned into Wood Lane and pressed the central locking system. As the car bumped along the uneven road surface, Jan maintained her vigilance and kept a lookout for any movement in the surrounding trees. It was a bright but cold day, with good visibility so it shouldn't be too difficult to catch a glimpse of them if they were watching her, as she suspected they were. She looked through the windscreen, the side windows and the rear-view mirror, but there was nothing so far. She was uncertain whether she should be relieved or more worried than ever. As she drew to a halt outside Ivy Cottage, her phone buzzed with a text message. It was from Chris. Have I been forgiven enough to take you to the cinema? She told him she'd think about it. I can't this week. I'm busy, she replied. Next week came his immediate reply before she'd even left the car. She didn't text back. Taking the bag of groceries indoors, Jan put the cold food in the fridge and left the other items she had bought for tonight on the counter in the kitchen. Food had enticed them to the window before, and she hoped it would again. All she had to do now was keep her nerve until dark and be ready with her camera. Chapter 44 Ian spent most of Wednesday afternoon in a secluded corner of the coffee shop laptop open, and using their Wi-Fi to work. It was easier to come here than go home and have to explain to Emma why he was back early from the office. She always arrived home before him, so he would return at his usual time and let her assume he'd been at work all day. But it was proving impossible to concentrate. His thoughts kept wandering to Moller and their meeting that morning. The more Ian thought about it, the more he saw that Carsten Moller had got rid of him very easily, by promising to check his records and offering compensation. Ian felt a sucker. He should have stood his ground and challenged him, asked him how many others had received the same donor sperm, demanded that Moller check his records in front of him and show him proof of his findings. Annoyed with himself for being so easily taken in, Ian finished his second cup of coffee and, staring at his laptop, tried again to concentrate on work. It was now four o'clock, and there was at least an hour and a half before he could return home. But the thought of seeing Emma didn't fill him with the joy it had just a few days ago. Before long, he'd have to tell her what the paternity test had revealed. It was going to be dreadful. It couldn't be anything else. His phone vibrated with an incoming call, and as he picked it up, he was surprised to see Moller's number. Good afternoon, Ian. Carsten here, phoning as promised. He sounded very upbeat. Yes, 
Ian said warily. I appreciated you needed an early response, so I cancelled my afternoon appointments to deal with your matter expeditiously. I'm sorry to say that the test results you sent me are correct. I've cross-checked our records and a mistake was made. An incorrect donor number was recorded on your file, and I'm afraid you and your wife do share the same donor. I thought so, Ian said numbly. I can only apologise, Muller continued. I'm assuming this is an isolated incident, but I will cross-check all my patients and donors right back to when I first opened the clinic. I will also implement a better system of record-keeping for the future. How many others share the same donor? Ian asked. I work within the current guidelines, which is that one donor can be used by ten separate patients. So the odds are this should never have happened. The chances of the two of you ending up together were incredibly slim. But I am sorry. Is it the reason Emma and I can't have healthy children? It's possible, Moller said. But it's more likely due to a genetic defect passed down by one of your mothers that didn't show on your DNA test. They are never a hundred percent accurate. I don't know what else I can do but offer my sincere apologies and compensate you and your wife. I hope we can come to an agreement so the reputation of my clinic isn't irreparably damaged. What do you think is a reasonable sum? I've no idea, Ian said. This has all come as such a shock. I wanted answers, not compensation. And I trust I have given you those. Discuss the matter with Emma and then come back to me. If you and your wife would like counselling, Edie is very good and, of course, there will be no charge. Ian sighed. I understand you need time, Moller said. Call me when you're ready. Winding up the conversation, he said goodbye. Ian returned his phone to the table and dropped his head into his hands. He supposed he should be grateful for Moller's honesty. But he wasn't. He was gutted. Compensation. When his and Emma's lives were in ruins, nothing could compensate them for that. The hum of conversation continued around him, and in the background, the hiss of the coffee machine as the barista brewed more coffee. It felt surreal, sitting here in the midst of normality, while trying to process something that was anything but normal. He and his wife were half-brother and sister. Ian raised his head. How the hell was he going to tell Emma? He still had no idea. He supposed Emma's parents and his mother would have to know too at some point. But he couldn't think about that now. What a fucking awful mess. He stared distractedly around him and his resentment grew. Moller had admitted his error very easily on the phone and had renewed his offer of compensation. Of course he'd want to keep them quiet. If this came out, it wouldn't do his clinic any good at all. How easy it would be to hold him to ransom and demand a huge sum. But there was no price on what Emma and he had been through, and had yet to go through. Nothing that could undo the harm that had been done. Ian stood, went to the counter and bought another coffee. The longer he could postpone going home, the better. Could others be affected? He wondered, returning to the table with his coffee. Moller had said he worked within the current guidelines, one donor to no more than ten families, so the chances were minuscule. But when had that rule come in? Ian googled the question and found it was only ten years ago, so hadn't applied when his and Emma's parents had used the clinic. Before then, artificial insemination by donor had been largely unregulated and at the discretion of the clinic. Had Moller been purposely misleading him? Ian took a sip of his coffee and slowly replaced it in the saucer. If there were others, what were the chances of Moller contacting them? Low, Ian decided. The only reason he'd admitted his error to Ian was because he'd shown him 
irrefutable evidence. Ian was sure Moller wouldn't have told him otherwise. How he would have liked to see his records. But if he asked again, he'd get the same reply, and Moller would hide behind patient confidentiality. Straightening in his chair, Ian closed the file on his laptop he'd been trying to work on and stared at the screensaver. His thoughts raced, going where they shouldn't. He broke out in a sweat as he considered the enormity of what he was thinking of doing. He'd be taking a huge risk. If he was caught, there would be a trial and prison. So he'd have to make sure he wasn't caught, he told himself. He was good at his job, one of the information technology team at Weatherby Security Limited. The company was in the business of keeping organizations safe. His department specialized in online security, advising clients on how to keep their companies safe from hacking and minimizing the damage if a company was attacked. In order to do his job, Ian had had to study how hackers worked. He knew how they got into computers and how to keep them out. Ian paused for a moment longer, took another sip of his coffee, and then moved the cursor on his laptop to go online. He doubted the Moller's computer was well protected from hackers, so it shouldn't be too difficult to access. And while using the public Wi-Fi came with its own security concerns, it also meant Ian's laptop couldn't be so easily traced. But just to make sure, he'd use a VPN, virtual private network, as he did sometimes at work. Ian glanced around. The nearest person was sitting far enough away not to be able to see his screen. Even if they could or someone walked past, he was just another customer with a coffee and a laptop. Before he lost his nerve and changed his mind, Ian logged into the VPN and began. Chapter 45 Five minutes later, Ian had identified the Wi-Fi router the Mollers were using at the clinic. It was only a short step from there into their computer. As he thought, it wasn't well protected, but he'd make sure he didn't stay for long. The less time he spent hacked into their computer, the less chance there was of being caught. Ian looked at the dozens of folders and remembered Edie Moller's exasperation when she told him over the phone how they'd had to go from paper record-keeping to digital. The records were a mess. There appeared to be little logic in the way the folders were listed. Ian opened and closed a few, looking at the files they contained and trying to work out if there was a system, and if so, what was it? Some of the folders bore recent dates, while others hadn't been opened for years. All of them seemed to be work-related, with no folders or files containing personal material like photographs and music downloads. It was impossible to know if all the paper files had been stored digitally, but Ian thought many had as the oldest was dated 30 years before. Plugging a USB stick into the side of his laptop, Ian began copying over the folders to examine them offline. When he thought he had them all, he logged out. Using the paper napkin that had come with his croissant, Ian wiped the sweat from his forehead. It was warm in the coffee shop, but that wasn't the only reason he was perspiring. He'd just committed a crime and now, with a mixture of dread and anticipation of what he might find, he began studying the folders and the files contained within them. Only some of the patient's folders were stored alphabetically by surname, as if Edie Moller had given up halfway through and had then just entered them in any order. A bit of time arranging the patient's files now would save him time in the long run, Ian thought, and he began putting them into alphabetical order. He saw his and Emma's parents' names on folders, but didn't open them at this point. He just tucked them into their alphabetical place. He was used to being methodical at work. 
There were two random folders that didn't contain patient details, and he moved those to the end. He began going through the folders of clients, starting with A. There were many files in each folder, some containing multiple pages. The first showed the patient's name, contact details, age, and date of birth. The next, their medical history, then diagnosis of infertility, treatment dates, and what appeared to be the outcome. In some cases, there was a record of a healthy baby being born. There were plenty of medical terms and abbreviations Ian didn't understand, but all the patient's files seemed to follow a similar format. It soon became clear that Moller had been tracking all those who'd used the clinic and their children. He felt uncomfortable, voyeuristic, reading all their personal details, but it had to be done. He left his and Emma's parents' folders until last, then, with trepidation, opened his parents first. Ian read of his father's low sperm count, how long they'd been trying for a baby, and the dates his mother had been inseminated with donor sperm. It had taken three attempts before she had conceived him. His date of birth was recorded, the sex, boy, and that he was healthy. He opened Emma's parents' folder and found similar information, although her mother had conceived on the first attempt. While some of this was what Ian would have expected from a fertility clinic, it seems strange that despite all this information, none of the patient files appeared to show a donor identification number, as Moller had said they did. He opened a few more, and then the two non-patient folders, but they didn't contain a list of donor IDs either. Somewhere there must be a folder containing donor details, their ID numbers, and a file cross-referencing them to the clients, as Moller had claimed. He must have missed it. Glancing furtively over his shoulder to make sure no one was watching, Ian quickly logged into the Moller's computer again. It was easier the second time. He had the login details. He began searching for any folders he might have missed, but he couldn't find any more. He then checked the hard drive for any folders or files that might have been deleted. Although deleted files disappeared from view, they could still be found on the hard drive if you knew where to look, which Ian did. It was part of his job. But the only deletions he found were junk mail. He then checked to see if there was any indication Moller was using other storage devices, an external hard drive or cloud, for example. But again, there was nothing. Puzzled, Ian logged out and returned to the folders he'd saved on the USB stick. He opened and skimmed through the other patient files but not one bore a donor ID number. Ian now looked again more carefully at the two folders that didn't contain patient details. The first was called Research, and contained published papers in the field of embryonic research, not surprising. The other folder was called Second Generation, and contained a spreadsheet with single-line entries of couples' names, their contact details, the dates of birth of their babies, and if they had survived. They weren't in alphabetical order, but date order, with the oldest entry at the top. Ian scrolled down the page and felt as though he was walking through an infant graveyard with so many babies not surviving. What was all this about? Some entries had the abbreviation of AL beside them, he guessed that was something to do with artificial insemination, as it was a fertility clinic. He continued through the spreadsheet to the last page. His heart stopped. The penultimate entry was Ian and Emma Jennings. But what was this doing here? They hadn't used the clinic. His mouth went dry. Beside their names were the dates of the deaths of both their babies. The second also bore the abbreviation AL. What the hell? Why was Moller collecting personal data on them? Not only did it not make sense, 
but it was a shocking invasion of their privacy. Ian looked at the very last entry, the one below theirs. Grant and Chelsea Ryan. Their address wasn't far away, and they'd recently had a baby girl who had died. The same abbreviation. A.L. was in the last column. Ian's phone vibrated with an incoming call, jolting him from his thoughts. He picked it up. It was Emma. Ian, where are you? she asked anxiously. It's seven o'clock. I've been worried. I'm sorry. I got caught up at work. I'm leaving now. Are you all right, Ian? You don't sound good. I'll explain when I get home. We need to talk. What is it? I'll tell you when I get home. Chapter 46 With his thoughts in turmoil, Ian tucked his phone into his jacket pocket, returned his laptop to his briefcase, and left the coffee shop. What the hell was Moller up to? He'd have to tell Emma everything he'd found out. He couldn't put it off any longer. But how and where to start, he had no idea. It was horrendous and confusing. Moller had admitted to him that he had made a mistake, and he and Emma shared the same sperm donor. But Ian hadn't found any evidence of that. Indeed, there was no evidence of any donors at all. Yet there must be hundreds, if not thousands, stretching back to when the clinic first opened. Instead, Ian had found that Moller had recorded the deaths of his and Emma's babies, and they hadn't used the clinic. It didn't add up. Moller treated infertility by inseminating the woman with donor sperm. His records confirmed that, but Ian was still no closer to tracing their donors or identifying how the mistake had occurred than he had been that morning. The only conclusion he could come to, he thought, as he drove, was that Moller must have another computer and had split the files between the two. Perhaps a laptop. Ian had only seen one computer, on the second desk in Moller's office, but there must be another one somewhere, containing this information, perhaps in his house. Frustrated, anxious, and dreading telling Emma, he parked on the drive and, with a very heavy heart, let himself into his house. Emma immediately appeared in the hall looking worried. I thought you'd left me she said with a nervous laugh and went to hug him. Ian stepped back. What is it? she asked. Are you okay? Are we okay? Not really, Ian said. Why not? Her bottom lip trembled. Come and sit down, love, Ian said gently. We have to talk. Cupping Emma's elbow. He steered her into the living room and to the sofa. I'm sorry for being so distant recently, Emma said, panic in her voice. I was down, but I'm a lot better now. I'll make it up to you, I promise. Dinner's ready. I'm not hungry, Ian said, his voice flat. He sat on the sofa beside her, his briefcase at his feet. What is it? Emma asked again, fear in her eyes. You're frightening me. Ian took a breath. Where to start? I haven't been to work today. No? Are you ill? He shook his head. I went to the Moller clinic again. Why? There was no easy way to say this. Our DNA test results came back, and they show we have the same biological father. He couldn't bear to look at her. No, that's not possible. Moller told you it wasn't. I know, but I've shown him the evidence and he's changed his mind. Oh my God, Ian! No! Could he be wrong? No. I'll show you the results. You have a right to know. Taking his laptop from his briefcase, Ian somberly lifted the lid, 
then open the page showing the paternity test. Paternity 99%, he said, pointing. It's definite. The colour drained from Emma's face. That can't be, she moaned, her hand going to her mouth. It's impossible. We can't be brother and sister. We are, biologically at least, we're half brother and sister. That's disgusting, Emma cried. I feel ill. Is that the reason we can't have healthy babies? It's possible, Ian said quietly. I don't know. That clinic has ruined us, Emma sobbed. All that pain and upset is too awful for words. We'll never be the same again. They need punishing. We'll tell our parents to sue them. They mustn't get away with this. She collapsed against him, crying. Carsten Moller has already offered compensation, Ian said. When? When did all this happen? She asked, raising her head to look at him. I went to the clinic this morning and showed Moller these results. He got back to me this afternoon, after he'd checked his records. He admitted there'd been a mix-up and we shared the same donor. He offered compensation straight away. But... But what? Emma asked. I don't know. Ian shrugged. I've just got a feeling there's more to it. What more could there be? Emma cried. Isn't this enough? It's horrendous. A nightmare. Her tears fell, and Ian comforted her as best he could. Who is our donor? She asked at length, wiping her eyes on the tissue Ian passed. Did you find out? No, that's the thing. I can't find any record of the donors at all. What, none? She asked. I don't understand. Where did you look? Emma, I'm going to show you something, but you must promise never to tell anyone, not even your mother. I'll be in a lot of trouble if this got out. I could go to prison. What have you done? Emma cried, more alarmed than ever. I hacked into Moller's computer, Ian said. Emma stared at him. You see all these folders? He said, showing her. They're Moller's files on his patients but not one of them contains information about the donor or even a donor ID. I've been through them all. So surely the information must be kept elsewhere, Emma said. That's what I thought to begin with, but I've been thinking about it and there's no indication he has another computer, nothing copied or erased. And why would he store those details separately unless he had something to hide? It was his work computer, his only computer as far as I could see. You'd expect it to contain all his work files. There's the one for my parents, Emma said, pointing. Can I have a look? If you want. Ian opened the folder and waited as Emma read the information. There's a lot of medical jargon, but it's more or less what Mum told me, Emma said at length. Ian waited until she'd finished, and then closed the file. He moved the cursor down to the last folder. And this one is odd, he said, opening the file titled Second Generation. It's a spreadsheet of couples, but we're on it. There are our names and contact details. But why? Emma asked, staring at the spreadsheet. My God! There are the dates our babies were born. Why would Moller have recorded those? How would he know? We've never been to his clinic. Exactly, Ian said. I've been thinking about this all afternoon, and the only conclusion I can come to is that this is a record of the grandchildren of those he'd treated. That's why it's called second generation. Their parents were the first generation but why he should be collecting that type of data, I've no idea, especially as we haven't used the clinic. I don't know if any of the others listed here did, and why did so many babies die? Can we report him? Emma asked with a shiver. 
It would be difficult, Ian said. We can't disclose how I came by this information. What about reporting him anonymously to the police? You can do it online now. We'd need to show that a crime had been committed, and we can't at present. There's no evidence, but look at this last entry, Ian said, moving the cursor to the line containing the details of Grant and Chelsea Ryan. They're local and had a baby recently. I was thinking of phoning them to find out what their experience was of using the clinic. I'd have to think of a reason for having their details. Perhaps you could pretend you were from the hospital health care team, Emma suggested. I had someone call me after the miscarriages and offer counselling. Ian hesitated. I don't know. What would I say? I'm better with computers than people. I know. Emma managed a small, sad smile. Shall I phone them? Do you think you could without giving us away? Yes, I think so. I know the sort of thing they say when they phone. Wouldn't talking about our babies upset you? Ian asked, concerned. Maybe, but I'll have to hide it, won't I? Emma said bravely. We need to find out what's going on, but if I'm going to phone them, I'd better do it now, before I have time to think about it and lose my nerve. What do you want me to find out? Anything you can about their experience of using the clinic. Shall we practice? Have a run-through. You could pretend to phone me and I'll answer. There's just the landline number, so... Be prepared for either of them to answer. If it goes through to voicemail, don't leave a message. We'll set our phone to private number so it can't be traced. OK, let's practice, said Emma, throwing her tissue in the bin. Ian made the noise of a phone trilling and then answered, Hello? Hello?